work for Dr. Teller, and we were working with um, non-humans, uh, that we had a base south of Riyadh in the middle of Saudi Arabia that was where we were assembling and doing research with these critters, some human looking and others kind of little gray kind of biological robots. It was so secret there that unless you were flown in by them, unless you were invited and taken there, if you approached it on foot, if you approached it by air, you didn't get close, you were immediately killed. Geoengineering and extreme weather, the Illuminati, nuclear warfare, the world is ending. No, I'm not talking about our president working with the aliens and the occult to screw with our weather and eventually lead us to World War III in a nuclear wasteland. I'm just saying a bunch of cool keywords to get your attention, and I hope I did so. But what that list does have in common is it covers a vast majority of different topics, which is what we're going to be doing today with our guest, Mr. Stan Dale. Uh, Mr. Stan Dale is a best-selling author and researcher and has been doing interviews like this longer than, almost longer than I've been alive. So it's going to be another great show, and I really look forward to it. Um, Mr. Dale joins us on the Sharpen Report for the first time, and uh, we're going to dive right into it. So, Mr. Dale, how are you doing today? Well, Sam, you can call me Stan. That's better. It's easier. All and right. I'll call you Sam. <laughs> Sounds Sam, great. The, the Sam and Stan show this morning. <laughs> oh, looking forward to it. Um, so, Stan, why don't you uh, just give us some background on, on who you are, where you came from, um, and just why you're all of a sudden studying all these important different topics. <laughs> well, it's not all of a sudden, Sam. I've been doing this for, oh, 60 years or so. Um, my uh, dad was um, uh, ex Air Force, Army Air Force, and when he came home from the war, he started uh, investigating the Illuminati, the, the uh, group that are kind of surreptitiously organizing a world government over many generations, actually. Anyway, so I, I grew up in the uh, study of the political structure of the planet and who's running it, really. Um, in about uh, the early 50s, 1950s, uh, my dad... Um, pulled me aside one night and he said, listen to this radio broadcast. We were listening to somebody talking about seeing a UFO flying over some mountain peaks over in the Northwest. I forget the guy's name. It's, he's pretty well known. But anyway, um, Dad says, you know, we got to figure out how they make those things. Uh, I heard about them in the war. And I said, oh, that's good. And so we all started uh, drawing pictures and he drew pictures and tried to figure out uh, means of doing it with propellers and stuff, you know, still in, in that mindset. So that laid the groundwork for me years later. Um, I, uh, we were in Dallas where I grew up and uh, I got an appointment to the Air Force Academy here in Colorado, just up the road from us now. And while I was at the academy, I studied a number of things. I was at the top of my class in the mathematics. Um, and after the academy, I studied computing at IBM in Dallas. Um, and uh, at home, there in Mesquite, outside the Dallas main city, city area, I started um, researching, you know, plasma drives and how to make a flying saucer like Dad and I talked about and uh, kind of saucer shaped. And it was all based on normal hydrodynamic stuff. But uh, anyway, it was just something I was doing privately in a, in a lab I'd built there at home. Somebody broke into the lab and brought daylight not long after that. And uh, my neighbor was at home and saw them and dragged me to the office and they saw him looking out the window and left stuff there you know, on the, the side of the uh, driveway and ran, you know, took off in their car. When I got home, they had uh, come in through my lab door and, and stolen a couple of, you know, s small things, a gun and TV set or something. Um, and um, the TV set was still sitting down the driveway. So they only got small stuff, which was odd. And um, about... Well, several weeks later, I guess, when I was at the office in Dallas where I was working for a multinational uh, company, uh, one of the vice presidents of our conglomerate came down and sat with me at uh, coffee break downstairs. There's, we could seat about a thousand people in that uh, 
building there in that coffee shop, which was for all the, the people that worked for this company. And uh, he seemed to know what I was doing at home in my research, you know, even what I hadn't uh, mentioned to you here about uh, added gravity. I was working on a way to influence Earth's gravity with uh, toroidal coils even then. But I was more more proud of my plasma drive uh, flying saucer. I was getting ready to file a patent on that, and he knew that. So that kind of got my interest. I thought, well, how, how does this guy know? I don't even know this guy. And uh, he told me, look, you ought to go talk to this friend of mine. Uh, you know, it's Dr. James R. Maxwell here in town. He'd be really interested in what you're doing. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll think about it. And, you know, got back to my office and tossed the note in the trash. I wasn't going to go talk to strangers about it. You know, I was fixing to patent him. Well, anyway, I waited about a month. Uh, and Well, it was about a month later anyway. And uh, this guy came back and sat right in front of me there downstairs in the coffee shop. And it was only just the two of us. I mean, you know, he could have sat anywhere. There's a plenty of room. But he sat in front of me and says, um, uh, you know, uh, my friend Jim says that you haven't been to see him yet. And I said, no, no, I've been busy. And he said, well, you have an appointment this afternoon at this address here at 3.30. Be there. Might have been, might have been 3 or 3.30. It was around 3 anyway. So that's where I met Dr. Maxfield. And uh, he informed me that they knew exactly what I was doing at home. I guess the break-in was more than just a break-in for the, uh, Steve, uh, stealing stuff. But anyway, that's how I got uh, invited to join the research project with Dr. Edward Teller down in Australia to research advanced methods of propelling spacecraft and aircraft. And here we are today. Um, a lot of my research covers things that aren't in the propulsion. They cover things in ancient history, discovering where the Garden of Eden really is. Uh, where Atlantis was and is still today. You can visit it. It's above water now. Um, you know, just things that interested me and uh, <laughs> able to, to track down. Well, I have to ask about Atlantis and it's above ground now. That's You can't just you can't just toy with me there. You have to dive in a little deeper with something there. Well, Sam, um, I, I have a, a video on the, uh, the lecture I gave in 2016 up here in the Springs. Um, if you go to uh, YouTube and look up Stan Dale's website and look for the Atlantis lecture, use the high definition when it's a much sharper, clearer picture. Uh, there's probably half a million people have already seen it. But look at that, and it will tell you all the details of what I'm going to tell you in summary now. Atlantis um, is one of several cultures that were on the planet that were not uh, Earth origin. They were extra. And now that can be from a parallel universe, uh, you know, and I think that's probably where it is, or some other galaxy or planet, whatever. Um, in the Bible, they, they talk about these beings as fallen ones kicked out of the heavens because they broke the rules that God had set for this planet genetically. Now, the Atlantis uh, settlement was one of about at least 12, and it, it could have been more than that, but at least 12. And Atlantis, we know about it because the Egyptians kept a record of it carved in a stone stela there in, uh, in, in near Suez in uh, Egypt. And uh, Plato got it from his uh, grandfather who went over there and had the, the stela translated. And so we know all about Atlantis, which was where the quote-unquote little g god Poseidon lived with his ten sons, five pairs of twins, and his human wife, Cleito. Well, that's Saudi Arabia. And it's uh, all of Saudi Arabia and all of the Saudi Peninsula was uh, ancient Atlantis. And it did sink for a while. Uh, but as the Earth expanded after the thing that caused the flood uh, caused it to expand, um, the coast of or the, the Mediterranean coast, which is the north, kind of the northwest side of Atlantis, raised up 1,600 feet uh, because the other part of the Saudi Peninsula was tilted down like this because two miles, two miles of junk from the bottom of the ocean and the mantle of the earth piled onto the top of Oman and right across the southern or southeastern part of the Saudi Peninsula. Now, what what caused that is the same thing that caused the flood of Noah in the Bible. Now, you know, we have all kind of read things like, okay, uh, it broke up the fountains of the deep and, and they were hot water and um, you know, it caused it to rain 40 days and nights, but the flooding continued for another 110 days. Okay, 
Noah lived in Atlantis, and the Atlanteans were those ones that were doing evil things, and you know, the, the Nephilim uh, that were created, things like that. And the Bible doesn't have as detailed account as Plato's account about this. So what caused this hybrid civilization between our worlders and humans to be destroyed? Now, we know God did that, but the mechanism was an asteroid. And I found it, first one to find it, and it's still got to be approved and for mainstream to say, yeah, okay, that really is an asteroid path, but it is. And it was about 12 to 15 miles in diameter, and it made a crater 250 miles wide. To date, it would be the biggest one ever discovered, uh, if they will approve my discovery. Um, and no one could see it because it hit so hard that the thin skin of the earth sitting on the mantle was shoved. And as it was shoved, it flipped upside down, actually. And it's where it is now. But before this, east was west and west was east. And the sun used to rise in what would be our west. But it didn't hit, this thing didn't hit and move the whole planet upside down, just the skin. It's like the skim on top of your latte or something, you know. Yeah. The Egyptian and Chinese records actually tell about two times in the past in recorded history where the sun rose in the east and it rose in the west, two, two different sets of times. Now, the, um, the planet used to spin pretty much vertically. But when it got impacted by this large asteroid, in fact, there's been two or three big ones. One landed up uh, north of where you live, uh, we think. It was a comet, and it hit from the north and came down like this and made that droopy part of Lake Michigan before it stopped and had a lot of water, of course, which it donated to make the lakes. Hmm. Anyway, that's another story. But these asteroids, uh, I found um, four other ones as well that have not been cataloged yet, and uh, some of them are, are pretty worn down now but anyway this the earth was smaller at that time uh, it was about 25 percent smaller than it is now and it was spinning mostly upright well after this impact and the flip we have a 23 and a half degree tilt to our orbit and we wobble like this eventually that wobble will probably slow down but when it hit it hit in the indian ocean and it hit on the east coast of india now you say well you know, they can't find a, an asteroid impact in the east coast of India, yet there's something called the Kudapa Basin on the east coast. And it has an arc, uh, like a rim of a big impact area on it like this. And then, then there's the Indian Ocean. There's nothing. And if you calculate the arc and go back to the diameter, it's about 240 miles in diameter. It's only a part of that arc. And the rest of it's not out in the ocean bed. So I thought, well, now where? Where is it? And then I looked india and the himalaya mountains up here above it all wrinkled and shoved up and i remembered they had they discovered sea fossils seabed stuff up on the top of the himalayas well how did it get up there ah of course i thought india used to be a much longer piece of dirt and when this asteroid hit it hit with such a force that it forced india's surface up like this to form the himalayas as it punched into what is now china uh, well, if that's the case, then I'll measure the distance from that. You know, I found the, the offshore hole uh, of the asteroid on the east coast of, of India. So I measured the distance from that and, and, and also calculated the stretch in India. Anyway, the, the, the hole I found in the middle of the Indian Ocean today, you'll see it on the YouTube when you get there. Very tiny little thing. But that's where it actually impacted. And the impact was such that this was the Saudi Peninsula, this was India, and the impact came down like this and hit, and the backsplash of it kicked India up into the Himalayas and threw a bunch of what they call ophiolite, which is a seabed and mantle, two miles deep worth of it over onto the tip of the Saudi Peninsula. And when this asteroid hit, because of the speed and the kinetic energy of it, it boiled up the sea and made a lot of water go up in the upper atmosphere. And that uh, water condensed over periods of time because it, it boiled the seas for a while. And that water became the rain that, that Noah saw for 40 days and nights as it was condensing up there and raining on the planet. The flood was that continued was from two, two things. First of all, the impact sent raging tsunamis across the planet. And uh, several times it circled the planet. 
that's why we find uh, you know skeletons of animals and stuff all swirled into a single uh, you know like vortex graveyard especially up around Alaska now um, that impact broke up the subsurface of the planet underneath the thin mantle it's what they call the Moho discontinuity today been named after Moho Rabijic a uh, 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 Yugoslav uh, scientist and when it broke up the the crust like that from the impact that hot water which is about three times little three times the saltiness of the sea you know it's specific uh, density and gravity it started to shoot up through these cracks and that's why the the the, the uh, scripture in genesis says and it broke up the fountains of the deep because it spewed up this super hot water from the impact that broke the shelves and also heated them so all these things add together to make a catastrophic impact that caused earthquakes all over the planet and eventually about 100 years later initiated uh, or, or it initiated then but what happened 100 years later was the continents all split apart it was pangea where everything was uh, gathered together in the time of the garden of eden even but after this impact everything broke and rapidly moved away from the impact site in the middle of the indian ocean Again, all these things you can see in the illustrations I've got in the uh, video. Uh, uh, now, as time passed, that you know that two-mile deep weight on on the Saudi Peninsula here tilted it up like that, sank this side, and raised that side 1,600 feet. Now, as time passed, rain continued and uh, storms continued and started to wash off this seabed and remove a lot of that two-mile thick, uh, you know, buildup on the this tip of uh, Saudi Arabia or the Saudi Peninsula, and it's leveled us back down to where we are now. For many, many, many centuries, people have tried to understand where Atlantis was by using Plato's directions. And the, the probably the major impediment to them finding the real uh, Atlantis was this. Um, uh, Plato's account said, if you look at the pillars of Hercules, you know, the gates of Hercules, Straits of Hercules and the, and the, and the uh, pillars, they're west of, uh, or let's see, what do you say? Yeah, they're west of Greece. Well, in today's map, west would be toward uh, the uh, um, Straits of Gibraltar. So everybody thought, right, okay, that's where the uh, pillars, the gateway to Atlantis was, so it'd have to be in the Atlantic, because, well, the name Atlantic sounds like it came from Atlas, all right? Well, when I started studying the, the, uh, surface of the planet having shifted up and down a couple of times, I realized that in the time of um, the actual uh, impact that caused the destruction of Atlantis, that the Earth was, or the surface of the Earth was upside down. So east was west, and west was east. So what was west in the stelas of Egypt at the time was what is really east today. So I thought, right, well, let's look, here's Greece, you know, let's look east of Greece today and see if we can find big mountains and straits leading to some kind of a big kind of island continent type thing. And that's uh, where I found the, the pillars of Hercules are um, at the port of Antioch in the Bible, but it's right in between where Syria, uh, Syria here and Turkey join. And there's two big uh, prominent mountain ranges, and those are the big mountains, the pillars of Hercules. And you uh, and I changed the water level on the computer using Google Earth and stuff, and I, I raised the, the water level from where it is now so that it flowed into that area. And I traced over it for days, just trying to get every little bit of where the water went at that altitude, you know, change it by 1,600 feet. Well, I found that when you went into the Pillars of Hercules, you had to go around a little corner, and then you could go into the, the waterway that led to what is now the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf. And that was the the, uh, the big water mass uh, that was on the um, the north side uh, or south side, if you look at the way it was, of Atlantis. So we had the Straits of, Her of Hercules, which were the water straits, and we had the gates. And you'll find that there are two different structures mentioned in Plato. The pillars you pass through, and the straits you traverse to get in to the sea that's where Poseidon built his island. Now... His island, uh, it said uh, in Plato's account, Plato's island was built in the time when men had not learned how to navigate the sea. 
So he built it out to sea. And if you see that, you see the Straits of Heracles, Hercules, in the upper right-hand corner. That's the Mediterranean up there. See, okay. And uh, down where it says the Arabian Sea, that tip down there, and all that kind of green stuff in there is low level. That's where a lot of the debris from the impact sank that part of the island and tilted it. Now, if you click on that, it's a, a very large map. Click over the word Persian and Persian Gulf, and you'll see right above the eye in Persian is a little tiny island off the coast with a pimple on it. Today, that island joins to the mainland, and it, it's uh, called... Um, uh, well, what is it called here? It, it, it's it's over the top of the of what's called the Damam, D A M M A M, dome, and uh, that in itself is an interesting uh, story. But um, uh, that because that's where the the Arabians found oil after World War II, and that was the island that that Poseidon built, and he built it circular and with alternate moats of water and earth around his castle where he kept his wife and kids. And then there was five miles of sea over to the shore at the time. But because the water level dropped and things tilted, it's dry now. But that is where Aramco, the American Arab Oil Company, has their, their original well. They drilled seven wells there after the war and paid the sheikh there 50000 in gold and said, look, we're going to look for oil here. First six wells just hit water. And they thought, well, we don't want water. We want oil. And the seventh one did hit. And of course, the rest is history. The Arabs became very, very wealthy. They they got the oil from on top of where Poseidon's castle was. And all the dead bodies and things that washed up there helped to make the oil. Now, that um, when they did that, that, that left a very circular footprint in the mud, which I, you know, I paid some people and, and uh, got some free stuff from uh, the uh, an institute over in um, California to put into my Google Earth to look down under the water and see where, you know, everything was shaped. I found the deep water port. I found uh, the circular rings on the island itself. And the, um, uh, the buildings and stuff that would be on land from there where you see uh, look at, I uh, go back, I was talking the wrong image for you. Go at uh, image 10. Underneath that image is a bit of an ex uh, explanation of it for you to tell you how I found it. But if you click on the image over where that little orange rectangle is there uh, in the Saudi Peninsula where it was Atlantis, all of that in yellow was Atlantis. And um, there was a fertile field uh, which was 100 miles wide and 300 miles down. I had to look to see if I could locate that to tell me where it, it should be close to where Poseidon's Island was near the coast. So I, if you go back one, one uh, screen to where to image 12 and you'll, you'll see three versions or three locations of that fertile plain. And I put them there looking for possible points where offshore could be Poseidon's Island to start with. And I, I did um, using Google earth. I was able to, tell the depth of the terrain and see where the water runoff was and Plato gives a tremendous account of where it is and how it looked and today that if you're looking at that, that uh, image still in the, the right side the most right side uh, yellow rectangle that is today called the fertile crescent of the world it's a very fertile and that was known in those times as the fertile um, field or the fertile plain and uh, part of it was rounded by the flow of the water coming down from the mountains. And if you look at this, up above the third rectangle, you see a red kind of smudge of, you know, like sand flowing down. And that's an old, old series of parallel cuts in the soil, which took mountain water from the mountains in the top right down through the fertile plain and, and just clipped the edge of it. And that's why I was able to locate the... Uh, the one in the middle as the location of where the fertile plain was and i'm telling you there was just a lot of detailed research to to find this stuff now they remember i told you the americans with the arabs there they found six water wells which they, they weren't interested they wanted the seventh one that was the oil well they wanted well they dug down and they found water which plato said was in the middle of the island there's only one place in the whole area that's got a 
a raised up island like that with a circular you know grooves around it on the mainland uh, sorry on the land of the uh, uh, island and in this image you'll see a little bump up there and that is the mom uh, you know uh, uh, dome uh, and it's underneath the island there and there are three sources of water underneath there Poseidon said he was a god so he was able to make hot water and cold water come up from the ground from two wells this used to have heated water in one of these layers here and the rest are normal rainfall cool water just across the, the Persian Gulf from there today even the there is hot water coming up from the, the ocean bottom there the seabed so it was part of the same uh, underground water source. So all these things I put together and I had a you know a big board here say, okay, we found this, we found that, okay. And every time I'd find something else, well, Holly was sitting over here at her desk and I'd say, come look at this, come look at this. Mm -hmm. We get all excited, you know, look, well, that's another proof. And there were so many of them that I was able then to, to make the argument for, uh, you know, the lecture that I gave in the Springs about it. Yeah, and that lecture will be down in the description, everyone, to definitely turn it in and watch that as well. I do have one question. I have, a, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but um, one being, is there, is there, um, is there documentation that they've dug up to to back this up, or even, even is is this idea found in in biblical texts, or you know, maybe even like the, um, you know, book things like books of Enoch or uh, pseudographical texts like that to maybe back some of this up. Um, the biblical text is very limited to Genesis um, in the account there of the Genesis 6 the Nephilim. Um, then on Noah, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, it didn't say he was an Atlantean, but it said that the flesh around him you know, had been corrupted. He was the only pure genetic line in his um, wife and his sons, and that's why they were spared from the flood. By the way, the flood left a lot of areas on the planet uh, not flooded. Um, when it says it flooded the air, it's, it's, it's not the earth, but the land, and it can be a region. That, that word, Ha'eretz, can be, you know, a planet, I guess. Um, in those days, it was the land or the country, and so Eretz was the land where all this bad blood was being uh, made between the aliens and the, and the humans. Um, the, as far as the book of Enoch, it talks about the giants coming and how they uh, and that's probably the Nephilim that were in that area um, and in the Bible it talks about um, uh, King of Og, uh, uh, King of Bashan, Og, who slept in a bed that was I think 18 feet long as I recall in feet and then there was Goliath and his brothers they were all big and from a tribe of big ones now this is what happened it, it, there were some of these corrupted uh, species left and animals as well as humans so when god had moses bring israel out of bondage in to claim the uh, promised land when they first sent spies up there to see they saw huge grapes and stuff and they saw gigantic people and they were afraid so that's why they you know the the tribe of israel could not go into the promised land immediately they had to wait 40 years until the old generation died out but when joshua took israel across in to um what would become Israel he um, he was told by God you go and you kill this particular tribe this, this city kill every living thing there including every animal because they had bad DNA and some of them were giants you know along the uh, Canaan side of it so these things do add up to hybrid beings and uh, they they survived the flood. Now rabbis will tell you, oh, it crosses our eyes because how do we how do we explain that the water killed the whole planet yet these giants survived? Well, it's because of the uh, misinterpretation of the of the application of the word ha'eretz. Anyway, that they they were still alive and were killed um, by a number of things actually. But in the Golan Heights today, there is a set of circular rings with the same ratio of the rings of of uh, land and water that Poseidon had around his castle. If you look at Stonehenge, similar thing. There are some blue stones in Stonehenge to represent the water. And they had to have a pathway cut for it, you know, in, into the center of these things. And in Spain, I saw these things. In uh, the Navo and Hopi uh, um, hieroglyphs, they show a picture of what could be Poseidon uh, with two water flows coming out of his hat, hot and cold with his ten sons represented as only shield, 
with his uh, staff and um, there is something else I saw it but anyway these things I talk about in the lecture so would you say that um, that Poseidon and, and Atlantis would be kind of the origin of this DNA manipulation to create these giants and, and Nephilim in that part of the world but we have similar legends of Quetzalcoatl in the Central America South America uh, in China, the red dragon, you know, um, these various cultures do have legends of super beings or strange hybrid animal human beings. Egypt has them. I mean, you know, the the head of a human with a wolf's head or something on it, you know, like, uh, what is it, um, Isis or something like that. I forget what they call that one with the black head on it, but Osiris maybe. Anyway, they, they have these things which we thought were just fanciful hieroglyphs, but in essence, they were hybrid beings. And if you look in the Book of Enoch, there's some interesting discussions in there about even the descendants of Adam, one of them coming with red hair into uh, Egypt, and uh, they call him Set, you know, Set, and yet, you know, Seth was one of the sons of Adam, and he lived a long time, even after, you know, uh, they left the garden. So these things tell us that there was a lot of stuff happening in that part, but also in, in the Central America and in China. And I'm pretty sure we had something happening down at the South Pole, which is now covered with ice. Um, so where they were, you know, at least 12, I think, from what uh, Plato's account is, there were 200 angels that were, they came down to Mount Hermon in, um, in uh, the Lebanon, I think it is, just uh, north of Israel. And uh, where they went as a group, maybe there was 12 settlements of these 200 split, spread across that. But the one we know the most about at this point is the Atlantic one in Saudi Arabia. Now, you asked if there were any other artifacts. Go down to image 38, first of all. You see where they've got that carving of uh, this god with two waterheads coming out and ten spears, his sons, and and you see a, a line c cut through those concentric circles, just like at uh, Poseidon's Island. And there are a number of other examples of that up there. These are called the keyhole formations, and they're made from black volcanic stones and they're in Saudi Arabia mainly on the um, Jordan portion and up in that side you know uh, uh, of, of the Saudi uh, Peninsula now there are over 1400 of these they've discovered so far and if you get down to ground level and look at them you know those rocks may only be about that tall they're you know maybe 8 12 inches tall and they're more like symbols than functional devices but if you look at them they've got a circle meaning the island and then the, or, you know, the outer limits, the island. then the, the um, center is where the castle is, the pimple that raises up. And you'll see two kinds. You'll see over the right side of it, you'll see a long straight line and then a circular thing with the dome in the middle. And then you'll see one that's got keyhole formations, two legs coming out, and it has a bigger, you know, like circle. Now, the reason that that was made, I am pretty certain, if you click on 19, there was one of the long uh, stone, you know, stone pathways to a circle. If you look at the uh, at Poseidon's Island there in the middle, uh, and the length of this thing to scale, which I've done it to scale, it matches what I recreated from Plato's account of the the waterway that went into the center, and then in the very center of the island where the ca uh, the castle was for Poseidon and his family. That's on the end of that straight line. And what are these pictures of? Well, I recreated okay. Poseidon's Island in, okay. in, uh, in a, a program, and I've taken some of the pictures that I just showed you from image 60 and, and put them to scale to match this drawing here, which was you know, the actual drawing by scale to what Plato talked about. And you'll see here that this one has two legs, and it has little bars going across the legs, which I'm pretty sure represent the land and the, the water, the alternate moats around the central castle. So I'm pretty sure that these represented uh, the long straight one was probably Poseidon, and the, the one with the two arms, two legs coming out would have been the female, uh, Cleto, his wife. And when you look through uh, Saudi Arabia on Google Earth, you'll see if, if you there's a one spot there that it's kind of light colored dirt because of the way they photographed it, but they have the, the male the symbol and the female symbol. And they've put a, a big fence around it like it's a revered place where maybe they buried him or something when they died. I don't know. But these these shapes and symbols are numerous all over the, 
the desert uh, floor there in the northwest, uh, close to where the, the volcanic ash and, and uh, rocks are. But there are other things I've found when I go down underneath what you think is the end of Google Earth, and you can punch through that level and look at the dirt underneath them, and you'll see they're not just sand. They've got photographs hidden under there. And uh, I found what looked like a, a four-sided flat pyramid covered in sand in one place out there, very squat one, not anywhere near as big as the Egyptian ones. But there are things like this all through that area that do prove that it was inhabited. And Lawrence of Arabia wrote about the, the Atlantis of the Sands, and he was, of course, in Arabia. And he talked to the Bedouin uh, uh, historians, you know, the Bedouin tribes, and their legends say that these things were left by the old men, they said, which means the men of the olden times before them, when the uh, Arabian Peninsula was an island, when it was an island. And I found out where, you know, it was cut off. It's not hugely an island because the width of the water coming in from the Mediterranean and, you know, doing a Z-shape down into the Persian Gulf, that was not like, you know, a huge sea out there. But it, it was disconnected from Egypt. It was disconnected from Europe, uh, you know, from, uh, well, Europe or Asia Minor. Um, so all these things add up to tell you that that's the place. And even the locals there, I mean, uh, you know, in the uh, Dubai, they have the Atlantis uh, Hotel with all of its goodies and Atlantis trips and that kind of stuff. Um, and the gold and the copper, uh, there's a particular mix of it called orichalcum, a mystery metal that the Atlanteans used to coat rock in three layers of, of rock that were coated in metal around Poseidon's castle, the uh, orichalcum, the tin, and the copper. And the orichalcum, the high part around his place, uh, Poseidon's place, you could see it for miles and miles in the sea when the sun shone on it. It, it was a ready gold. It was better than copper. It was ready gold, highly prized. And, you know, I, I was able to determine where two big mines were uh, on the west side of, you know, over by the Red Sea of Saudi Arabia and down in Oman. Both of them produced gold over the, like, thousands of years. And they came from, like, long strips of, of uh, ore that was primarily copper and uh, zinc and uh, uh, tin. Anyway, these things it formed what's called mountain copper, and orichalcum was mountain copper. That's where they got the gold. They got rid of that as a slag, and they used that slag because it was malleable. And today we call it um, an alloy number CR32000 or something like that. I've got it uh, listed here. Maybe in slide 23 it tells me. Yeah, 23000. It's red brass. Uh, alloy number C23000. And it's uh, got copper, lead, zinc, and uh, tin in it. Anyway, I found orichalcum and two sources of it, huge sources that have been mined in ancient times before the flood. Uh, again, that tells you what this mystery metal was. Now, they, they paved the streets in, in uh, some of the, the towns of Atlantis with this because it was such a, a non-corrosive metal. You know, it just didn't uh, rust or oxidize, or very slowly anyway. <clears throat> but because of the lead content, they even made plates and ate off of it, right? I suspect that toward the end of their, their time, that they went even crazier than normal because they were getting lead poisoning through the food they were eating on that and through their bare feet walking on the streets paved with it. A lot of little things like that. And I, and I found an area where I think they housed their military. They tell how many they had in the Plato account. And they're little segments of land uh, that are scored off and uh, rectangular shapes that can only be seen from the air. And I don't know how they did that, because today we'd have trouble doing it. A lot of mysteries there, and um, it is found. It, it, that is Atlantis. If you look at, at image 24 there, <clears throat> here's what I was telling you a while, while ago about the Straits of Hercules and the, the, um, the, the Pillars of Hercules. The red arrow point, or sorry, the yellow arrow points to the, the uh, seafare, the seaway that goes and... and kind of does a Z-shape uh, to form the straits. But those two mountains, the left and right side there, are the pillars, the great big huge pillars. You can look at all these things and use them if you wish in, in what we're talking about here to illustrate it on your screen. Um, and in image 27, in um, 
the in Santorini they had frescoes of beings, you know, humans uh, playing a game of uh, grab the the bull's horn, horns, and flip over the top of it and and do it so you can bounce off his back and out the other side and stay alive. This was a test test of youth in the times. This was spoken of uh, the worship of the bull in the Atlantean documents, and I think that some of the people at Santa, Santorini may have been descendants of these beings because they, they preserve these arguments in their frescoes. And if you look at the origin of cows, every cow on earth has its origin in the Fertile Crescent there in the middle of what is, uh, was Atlantis. Interesting. But there are just so many things like yeah. that to come up. Yeah. Well, I do have to ask you in, in an effort to, you know, relate this to today. It sounds a lot like so we have this this culture that's centered around a god um, that controls all sorts of, you know, basically what their water, their lifeline. And then they, they live in this society that it seems like they're being poisoned by, you know, just their surroundings, whether it be in their water, in their food. Um, and then they're, you know, focused on all these sporting events and, um, you know, it kind of, it, 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 there's, there's tones to this, you know, this occult nature that can be applied today. Do you see, do you see that? Do you see that comparison? Is that a fair comparison to make? To the world or to Saudi Arabia? Well, I would just say to the world in general of, uh, of this occult nature centering around a God transitioning to what we are in today. Have you ever heard of the UFO researcher Linda Moulton Howe? Linda and I have talked over the years by phone, and she was in the Pentagon probably three or four decades ago and passed some generals that were talking in the hallway, and they were saying that what is happening in the Middle East is the return of the Sumerian gods. These super beings are reappearing. Now, why that's interesting is I I was told about a base by my security team when I worked for Dr. Teller, and we were working with um, non-humans, that we had a base south of Riyadh in the middle of Saudi Arabia, about 120 miles down the Jabal Tuwak mountain range, that was where we were assembling and doing research with these critters, some human-looking and others kind of little gray, kind of biological robots. It was so secret there that unless you were flown in by them, unless you were invited and taken there, if you approached it on foot, if you approached it by air, you didn't get close. You were immediately killed. Wow. You weren't allowed to, there was just a, a death sentence. There was no argument, no discussion. You, you're destroyed. That's how secret it was. Now, if that was where these fallen ones that we were working with, is, their headquarters is now, for instance, then you can see the rise of Atlantis again. Mm-hmm. And they were not good. Right, um, and I think that we're seeing that it's going to come from the same area where the the biggest intrusion, you know, into God's law occurred, and uh, it, you know I think even the Antichrist will come from that area. That definitely makes sense to come full circle. We see it all throughout Scripture, um, the way things come full circle, and that especially where regions are so important to you know you know talk about Mount Hermon and all the important things that happen there. And so ge- geography is extremely important. So it wouldn't surprise me if it came from the same place of of Atlantis. What what can we do? At, you know, so it's, it's so secretive we can't get to it. Like how do we fight against something like that to stop it from becoming too large and you know eventually going down the same path that Atlantis did and end up in total destruction. Well, I think that what we're going to see is that Satan is the leader of them, and um, he will pose as a messenger of you know, peace, love, harmony, light, and will put a good lie to the people of Earth very shortly to offer a solution to our nuclear warfare, to our geological distress, to astronomical distress from asteroids and things that might collide with us, and uh, controlling diseases and all kinds of things, the economy. He will offer that, and he will appoint his man, a human, to run it. That will be the Antichrist. Now, I think that that will occur uh, very soon, in fact. So we, we are at the bottom of the snowball falling downhill or rolling downhill. We can't stop it. And only God can stop it. And, and Jesus and his uh, uh, soldiers, which will be some of the Christians that have already gone before us and some who are raptured, they will all come and they will fight with this army at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And that will be the Armageddon War. Um, you know, without without the help of the Messiah, we, we cannot have technology to fight these guys. They, they, they're too far advanced. They're very, very intelligent. And 
without help. As I say, we just can't beat them. So you pray that you're found worthy to be caught up out of here at some point and to be on, on God's, well, Jesus in particular, his army to come back and fight and uh, lock up the bad guys. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to fight in that war. It, I, it sounds like, I mean, can you imagine fighting in the army of God, literally, like, standing, like, looking back and Jesus up there? I don't know. It just sounds awesome, and it, it's kind of exciting to me. In all, it well, was, it is. It is. Some, yeah, I agree. Some people, some people can take a message like that of doom and gloom, and we're all screwed. But really, if you look at it, it's going to be <laughs> awesome, and we're going to fight in this war, and... I'm excited for. It. I can't wait. Uh, you know all the all the hardships. Just think about it, people. All the hardships you face and all the difficult things you go through, and you just can't put a finger on where that evil's coming from. Just imagine a moment where you know exactly where that evil's coming from, and you get to pay it back for all that crap you went through. It's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome. Well, let me let me let me just um, uh, underscore that here too. You were saying you can't wait till you can be in that army, which means you'll either died and and raised up into your new body, or you will have been changed in, in that rapture event. But having nearly died myself, and, li and I left my body in 1969, I was quite ill. Um, when I left the body, I noticed immediately that the power of my mind, it was like coming out of a tight shoe, my mind exploded in what I could think and do and reason. Um, so when we get out of here, we'll have enough smarts then to, even with the same weapons, to outsmart the bad guys. So in that war you're fighting, you won't be disadvantaged by technology, uh, and you won't be disadvantaged by intellect, all of us that are in that. And so, you know, I'm sorry that he rebelled, and a third of the angels rebelled with him, but uh, their punishment is going to be, they're locked up and uh, for at least a thousand years, and after that maybe they're destroyed, I don't know. Oh, that's interesting too, you know, at the end of the book of Revelation where it talks about the earth and the heavens are destroyed in a fire, that's like parallel universes and the one that's above us in energy is consuming ours and at the end of the thousand years there will be this big meltdown and a new heaven and a new heavens and a new earth will will form so it's i know that this is happening because when when god walked with noah when he walked with with adam and eve in the garden you know he could touch them they could touch each other they talked and hey how you going that kind of stuff cool of the day no problem Come to time of Noah, no problem. All right, now Noah, he tells him how to build the ark and what to stock it with. And okay, they're talking, you know, quite frequently about it face to face. Come to the time after the flood with Moses. Moses is up on the, the mountain where the burning bush is on top of the, the mountain of fire. And he's talking back and forth with God at that point. And he says, um, <clears throat> you know, God, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be rude. I'm paraphrasing. But he says, uh, I'd like to see what you look like. I'm, I'm, you know, what am I talking to? And God says to him, well, you know, Moses, if I were to stand in front of you in my form, the energy of my presence would destroy your body and kill you. But what I will do is have you go over here into this crack in the mountain here, this, cl this uh, cleft. Put yourself in there and I will bring a cloud over where you can see it and I'll project my image up onto that cloud so it doesn't hurt you. We found uh, the real... Um, a number of us have found this, uh, the real Mount Sinai. It's not on the Sinai Peninsula. It's in Jordan. It's um, called the Burning Mountain. It's n next to um, uh, Jabal el Laws. And if you look at this mountain, even on Google Earth, and get down and look at it, it's burned black, and it's got cracks in it, fissures that form cliffs, which would have been perfect. And we also found on the east side of that, you know, where he had the tribes, where they had the water, um, uh, you know, it's just you can you can look at the exits where they had the the uh, place to sacrifice the cattle and how it was laid out exactly as, according to what's in the Bible mm -hmm. on the east side in the desert there in southern Jordan. I mean, it's just wow, so many things all add together. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. The the energy density is getting greater for for God's universe and where He is, and we're being we're losing energy in our universe, huge entropy. So. We can't be in his presence now by the time of Moses, and certainly by now we couldn't. Uh, even when Jesus ascended, he said to Mary, who wanted to touch him, uh, don't, don't touch me yet because I haven't ascended. I've got to convert, you know. And so when this universe is destroyed, it's talking about in the uh, last part of the book of Revelation, is when I think his universe consumes this one and makes a, a better one in his place.
concentric universes. Uh, I mean, then you could even dive into the, you talk about the ge geograph ge geographical um, things that point to that, but you can even look at the, the science when you get into the quantum physics and the way things break down and react and, you know, the the different dimensions that you can dive into when you get into subatomic particles and how that could, that really makes sense, uh, you know, talking about the different dimensions and how they can collapse on each other. A, co a parallel universe is another dimension, if you mm -hmm. wish. Uh, it exists uh, out of phase with ours, and it's warmer there. Even in the time of Ezekiel, when God came through on his flaming, or, or whatever came through on the flaming chariot, uh, he, uh, Ezekiel looked up and he sees on the horizon in the sky this burning flaming chariot. It was hot and it came down, and I suppose it cooled there in the river uh, before you know Ezekiel got too close to it. But this tells us that that universe, that dimension, is higher energy on the average particle than here. We, on, on the other hand, are higher energy per particle than the concentric universe beneath us, which might be the Tahom where the Satan is cast. You, you've heard legends or myths of ghosts appearing in a room. When the ghosts appear, the room gets cooler. It's because the ghost is coming from a lower energy density dimension universe and sucks energy out because he it's cooler. And on, on the on the on the Earth too, when it was 25% uh, smaller in diameter, the oxygen was richer. There were no uh, clouds. There was a, a a big like mm, super humidity thing that let the sun in, and it was a good growing climate. The gravity was 1.6 times what it is now, stronger because of the concentrated mass. So when the air was thicker, which it was the flying dinosaurs could get lift with this soupy air that they were in. Um, and that's why the dinosaurs had such big legs and arms and bodies. They had to move in a stronger gravitational field. It all fits, doesn't it? Yeah, and then that asteroid, then would you say that the same asteroid came that demolished that, that kind of transitioned us to the days of Noah, through the days of Noah? Would that be the same one? Yeah, same one. And after that, uh, lifespan of the human dropped. Less air, less oxygen. Gravity was weaker. That's not an all-encompassing episode of the Sharpie Report. Like I said in the beginning, we're going to cover so many different topics and go all over the place. And it's just fascinating to walk through, you know, especially focus on Atlantis for so long and look at the fallen angels and, and some of their culture and how they built up a society there and then how that kind of transitions to today and how we're looking at a, a similar thing coming out of Atlantis and how we're going to be leading to this great war where we are in God's army fighting and we have the intellect and the the strength to fight in that war. And, and just let us never forget that right now, God gave us the power over principalities and the darkness of this world to take it on now and do what we can to slow that that snowball as best we can. Uh, so, Mr. Dale, thank you so much for coming on the Sharpie Report. I appreciate it. Where can people find you, support you? What are you doing these days? Well, they can go to our website. Uh, Holly, my wife, updates it six days a week. Um, with news, current events that are of particular interest to Christians um, and also of interest to the non-Christian as far as what's going on where we're heading toward a world government. Um, the uh, my I'm working with some of my other associates on generating a, a way to get electricity out of the atmosphere for free for people. And that's what we're working on here. In fact, behind me here, you see that blue screen. Right now, that's monitoring uh, 2 million frequencies in our atmosphere watching the effect of the solar wind and this G2 storm on every frequency because that tells us where some of the huge amount of energy is. And if you look, I don't know what side of your screen that is, but where my finger is pointing there, that white thing, <clears throat> that's a field of very strong energy in the radio spectrum, which is coming from the solar wind. Huh. And so you are building a, uh, a machine to pull that energy out and supply it to people? It's uh, We've talked about it uh, publicly. It's not a big deal because uh, the patent office won't give patents. on. I, I applied um, probably 10 years ago, and they denied, said it can't possibly work. And then they put my patent application, not the patent. They didn't give me a patent, but they put my application up on the Internet for everybody to see. So I thought, right, I figured they might do that. So I put the basic system in there without all the goodies on it. But basically what we're doing is lightning and the solar wind are creating what's called electrostatic waves in the atmosphere. Uh, and these are not at a certain frequency, they just are random. And those vibrations in a charged atmosphere 
we can tie into that with a special kind of capacitor. And when the capacitor gets squeezed, if you wish, or vibrated by these things, it produces electricity. It's much like what Dr. T. Henry uh, Murray did in 1935, and he tried to file a patent with a working model, and they said, where's the energy coming from? He says, well, I don't know, but it works. And he was drawing 5 to 10 kilowatts of power continuously, and they said, well, since you don't know where it's coming from, we won't grant a patent. So this is the insanity <laughs> of it all. But we're trying to get this ready for people who will be here during the, the uh, tribulation period and in exile, because to avoid the numbering, you're going to have to be kind of portable and have your own power and food and water somewhere. Uh, well, you sound like Nikola Tesla, first of all, creating, uh, you know, pulling energy out of nothing. They also sound like um, the girl from Atlas Shrugged. Um, who's and Rand uh, talk about John Galt. Yeah, John Galt, and, and, but the, the, the main character is a Dagny. Well, um, I, I, uh, I studied that. Uh, you know, Anne Rand lived in the time when uh, Thomas or T. Henry Murray was building uh, and trying to patent his thing that took electricity out of the air, just like the hero in her book in Atlas Shrugged, you know, John Galt. And uh, whether it was that or whether it's, we're trying to make it as simple as possible so the lightning strikes won't bother it, we are now looking at uh, using an electrostatic motor, and, and these are common, your know, desktop things, uh, they've been common for 50, 60 years, but uh, we would power that motor with high voltage coming out of our, uh, of our collection uh, system, right? And as it spins, it will turn another little motor, which makes electricity for your house. And it was like in the movie, they had this John Galt um, motor, which was run by the atmosphere. And every person in the valley had their own antenna. What, what, in the movie, they showed one. Actually, Holly and I were invited to the um, uh, to the uh, premiere of that in uh, Los, uh, Las Vegas because oh, really? we, contrib we contributed to the funding of the movie. Yeah. Well, I have never seen the movie, and I read the book, and it was my favorite book I've ever read. So I'm I was nervous to see the movie. Well, about the only thing I got out of the movie uh, was you know the the motor and how it worked uh, a little bit there. You know, they showed uh, snippets of it. I tried to tell the guys, you know, beforehand, you need to do such and such and such to make it you know, follow the book. But anyway, it's like we're uh, several John Galt's. Uh, yeah. uh, my, my, my team, let's see, we got four, five, six, we've got seven members of our team between Colorado and Kansas. And uh, we meet uh, periodically and share information. And uh, we're, we're cutting new ground for us anyway, much like what Ann Rand wrote about. Yeah, well, if you... Uh create a Galt's, a Galt's Valley, let me know about it because I'm totally in. Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for coming on the Sharp Report. I appreciate it. Uh, go and support. Go to standeo.com uh, and you can, there's even the GoFundMe page for this electric motor to help support him in that. Please do so. He is all over you know, the interwebs. And he's on the Hagman Report. He's on Alex Jones. He's on you know, all over the place. So just go in and watch him. It, it, we covered a lot of things today. It may have sounded out there on some situations, but hey, that's what we study these things and it's all backed up by, by facts and, and interpretations of those facts. So, so please go support Mr. Dale. Um, and that being said, this is our last, uh, yeah, this is our last show of September. Uh, in October, we got some exciting things coming on the Sharpie Report. We have, um, you know, spiritual stories from guests that we've had on the past and their encounters with angels and demons and how that looks. Uh, and then also, I'm not going to ask you to like, subscribe, or share, but I appreciate it if you do. Um, and then hit the little bell button if you want to get notifications. But again, that's your own desire. Go ahead and do it. Um, and that's what we have for this episode of The Sharp Report. Thank you again for tuning in, and I will see you next week.